<clears throat> All right. Um, the discussion so far has been about dynamic server-side pages, pages that um, are not completed HTML pages, but instead are a mix of some server-side code and some plain old HTML. And the server's job then is to take that code and to translate it into an HTML file. So the server does a little bit more work uh, in this environment because it doesn't simply take and deliver the files to the client. It does some sort of processing. And the example we saw last time showed uh, an ASP.NET calendar control, which is simply one control, but when it gets rendered uh, by the server, it translates that one ASP.NET control into a whole bunch of stuff. And what kind of stuff? Well, the stuff the browsers understand, right? Because it's delivering a web page, it's going to be processed by a browser. So it delivers a mix of HTML, CSS, and JavaScript. All right? Um, so the idea here is that we're taking some common functionality, something that might appear on a bunch of different web pages, and creating a component for it. So you don't have to reinvent the wheel each time. You don't have to start at square one each time. You can instead use these components to build your application. Now to be sure, you're going to have to write some code in there and configure the components and do that sort of thing. But the idea is that it sort of gives you a jump start. All right? uh, any tool that does, um, that takes care of a certain amount of my work for me, if I have to go in and, and, and do some specific things, that's okay as long as it, as long as it takes some of the easy things that I do, uh, or, or a lot of the repetitive things that I do, and make them easy for me, then I'll be happy to go in and fill in the gaps and, and do what I need to to, uh, to complete and get everything working. So we're going to explore some more controls today. And we're going to also uh, explore the second aspect of these controls. And that is that they can be programmed. All right. What I mean by that is, is that all these controls have certain properties associated with them. All right. They're all objects. And what do objects have? Well, they have properties and methods. Well, they all have properties, and you can configure those properties. But you can configure those properties both in design mode, when you're first creating those components and putting them on the page. You can say certain things that you want. But then, through your code, you can go in and set some of those properties. All right. So that's what we're going to spend a little bit of time doing today. Again, the idea here is, is the, the specific examples I cover are less important than getting the thought down. That is, we can create these components. These components generate HTML. But then we can program them. And any of the properties that we set in our design mode, we can go in and we can change via our code. All right. Another thing about these controls that is important to keep in mind is that these controls maintain state. All right? This will become apparent, more and more apparent as we go through these examples. And it would become even more apparent if, for example, you did some PHP programming where that doesn't necessarily automatically happen for you. But we're going to look, what I mean by maintain state is that it remembers its properties. It remembers its status from page to page to page, from submit to submit to submit. We'll talk a little bit about the form cycle, how a form displays, then gets submitted back to the server, does its processing, and redisplays. The nice thing about that is automatically those .NET controls maintain their state. That is, remember the values that they had previously. And we'll talk a little bit more about that as we look at at forms, and we'll see some examples of that, and, and so on. Um, HTTP, the protocol itself, really is a protocol that has no state. It's called a stateless protocol. And what do I mean by that? I mean 
mean that in essence, every one of these requests, through the HTTP protocol, there's nothing within the HTTP protocol that sort of binds these requests together. You know, that you made this request and you made that request. Each request is more or less a standalone thing. All right? Now we know that something has to be going on to do some sort of remembering, right? Because when you log into Angel, it remembers who you are, all right? That aspect of remembering something that was entered previously or something that happened before is known as maintaining state. And we'll look at some examples throughout the semester of different ways that that's done. The thing to keep in mind is, in, in essence, that's not part of the protocol. That's something that the, the stuff on the, the code on the server does. The co code on the server maintains that state. And the good news for us is the .NET components help us by automatically maintaining their state as we display a form, then submit it back to itself. Yes? So if you submit a form and you forget to fill in one required field, and then it says, like, do it again, then everything else should still be there, and you just have to fill in the one that you didn't? Yes. Um, it, yes is a short answer to that. The, the long answer to that is that depending on how the browser is configured, that might not have even made it to the server because the JavaScript validation was done. All right? So uh, it's not a matter of redisplaying. But... Your answer is correct. For example, if JavaScript were disabled and the server did the validation, then yes, the rest of the code <coughs> would, would retain their values. Sometimes they don't. Then what do you figure? It's on PHP or something? Or? Could be anything. Someone didn't do a good job is the bottom line. All right. More than likely what happens is, is their server is doing the validation as opposed to having client-side validation. We could probably assume that right off. Um, and either they're not using the .NET platform where the state is maintained, or they're using it and deliberately breaking it for no good reason. So um, the bottom line is that boils down, no matter how you slice it, that boils down to bad programming. All right? That shouldn't happen that way. All right. Let's take a look at our friend the calendar control again. But let's add a little bit of interactivity to it, to, to, to do some things with it. Did you figure out the red? Did I figure out the red? No, I didn't. Remember, I said that it was up to you folks to figure that one out. I washed my hands of that one on <laughs> Thursday, if I recall correctly. Normally, you get annoyed enough that you don't. <laughs> uh, well, this would be the exception then. All right. So let's go in and um, I'm going to go and I'm going to create a new app just to review the process of creating the web app and all that. I know, we, you know we've seen it a couple times and, and you, you've probably done it on your own, but just to make sure that we know how to do it. I'm going to go into Visual Studio 2010. Start Visual Studio. Do some shadow. Puppets while we wait. I'm going to go up here and click File, New, Website. For the first several, I'm going to simply create an empty website until we're, I'm ready to talk about the stuff that you get when you say to create an ASP.NET website. Because that, that gives you a little bit of a, of a head start as well. But at this point, we want to um, code everything ourselves. So I'll go and create an empty ASP.NET website. 
And I will say I want it to be in C, Visual C Sharp instead of VB. Now, how many of you have done C Sharp coding before? Any of you? All right. That was sort of my expectation that most of you have not done C Sharp programming. That uh, if anything you've done, probably Visual Basic programming. How many of you have done VB programming? Yeah, that's kind of what I expected. The good news is, is that um, the programming is only part of the challenge here. You know, your challenge in this class um, is to understand the .NET framework and understand how to use the .NET framework, and being able to code things that use the .NET framework. So. We're not exclusively going to put our heads down and just be coding all the time. A lot of what we're doing is configuring those components, all right, and setting up and identifying what we need and putting them on the page and so on. So we don't get as involved, for example, in the, in the guts coding thing, say, as Nora does in, in his classes. Um, I will probably on occasion need to look things up myself because I haven't done a lot of C-sharp coding. Um, I will say anyone that has done some JavaScript coding, or I've done Java coding, um, you will notice that the, the, the syntax more closely resembles that than VB. And really, um, if you understand things like if statements, loops, assignment statements, variables, it's just a matter of translating. Like, okay, you did it this way in VB, you'll do it this way in C Sharp. So I'm not terribly concerned uh, about that. All right. I get to say where I put it. And I will put it on the desktop. name, not just taking, you know, website one, website two, whatever. And away we go. Remember, when this is done, what you get is you get a folder wherever you said you're going to create it. In our case, it was on a desktop. And it contains one file and one file only, and that is the web config file. That web config file gives parameters about the application, and there's really nothing too exciting in it now, but as the semester progresses, we'll put some more things in it. One thing I would urge you, if you're doing any sort of programming or web development or anything along those lines, is to turn your file extensions on, all right? Um, by default, most Windows machines and, and uh, definitely the machines on campus are set up to hide those extensions. Um, and, you know, the reason for that is, you know, that can be confusing for novices, I guess. But we're not novices in this class, or if we are, we'll, we won't be soon. And therefore, we want to go into properties, I'm sorry, folder and search options, view, and uncheck this hide extensions for known file types. And now we can see that really the full name of that file is web.config. All right, it's always a good idea to do. Um, if nothing else, help you keep the extension for images straight. If it's a JPEG, if it's a GIF. If it is a JPEG, what's the particular file extension for it, and so on. Let's take a peek at that file real quick. And really there's not a lot about it. Not a lot in this one. It's just a very bare bones, basic um, stuff that we will put in. Uh, that, that we put in. Uh, I'm going to change this to true, all right, so that we can debug this application. If we don't, we'll get that nifty little warning message that you probably have seen before that says the web config file is not set up for debugging. Do you want to change that? Answer yes, and it will change that for you automatically but I can go in and change this right here. And then the framework of the, the ASP.NET that the, that the code is going to be compiled for. All right. Uh, 
I'm going to go in and cre create a new page. So new, file, and I will create a web form. Web pages in .NET are called web forms. They typically will be forms. Um, even if you don't really have any form items on them, like, you know, form items like text boxes or drop downs, the pages you create are forms. One of the reasons for that is, as being a form, there are things that help the server maintain state and remember things and, and allow those controls to maintain state. So when, 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 we, when we create this with the calendar and we recreate what we did last time, we'll take a look at some of the hidden fields on, on the page. And, and those fields, again, help the server maintain state. Yes? I was also thinking if you left it that way, if it was called, since it's called a form, if you were if it didn't have a text box to begin with, it'd be easier to put a text box in and call it a form without getting too confused sort of thing. You know, add to it instead of... Um, possibly. The, the, the main idea, though, is, is that these are forms to help remember state. And so even if it's not a form and there's, there's nothing to enter in, you still want to keep it a form for that reason. All right, so let's go and create that. Here it is. I'm going to go and take my calendar and pop it in there. Again, you can work either in design mode or the source view or a split that shows you sort of the best of both worlds. Any of those are okay. The only thing I will caution you against is do spend some time in the source view so you actually see the code is getting generated. All right. I want you to really understand the framework and really under, understand what's going on. And a lot of times, if you spend all your time in the design view, all you're doing is dragging and dropping and right mousing and that sort of thing. And you're never really seeing the code and, and getting an understanding of how the code works. Now. You might say, well, I don't care if I understand how the code works as long as I get the job done, right? Well, the problem with that is when things don't work exactly the way that you expect them to, um, a lot of times it is more efficient to actually look at the code and see what's actually going on than to try to scroll through a list of properties and scroll through the GUI and all that. Remember, the, the purpose of a good GUI is to sort of hide some of the details from you, right? Um, the code view, you have all the details there in front of you, and you can see it. So, therefore, don't be dependent on the GUI, if you want to, the, the GUI design tools. If you want to use them to, to help you get your job done, that's fine, but don't be dependent upon it. All right, this is the example we did last time, all right? I can now go in and run this. Notice debugging starts right away. I don't get the little warning message, if you recall, that I got last time. Um, because I manually set that option all right, to, uh, in the config file to allow debugging. And this is what I end up with. All right. It, again, if we do a view source here, we're viewing it from the perspective of the client. And you see that it took all that, or took that single ASP.NET control and translates that into a whole bunch of HTML, JavaScript, etc. Now, some of these hidden fields here are those fields that I mentioned before that are useful in the server maintaining state. How do they work? I don't know. All right. That's all sort of behind the scenes. But they are important because they help the server remember what's going on. 
and what has happened before. These are hidden form fields. Um, in HTML class, when we talk about forms, I a lot of times don't even mention hidden form fields because, you know, they're hidden. You don't see them. What's the purpose for them? The purpose for them is simply to maintain state. You can put something in a hidden field, and then it's available to subsequent pages. All right? Um, and, and therefore, it's a way of remembering something. It doesn't appear on the page, so the user can't change it, and the user can't manipulate it, or it's not confusing to the user, because it's hidden. But then it is available for the server to help it sort of maintain state. Okay. So let's close out of this. That should be review. That's what we did last time. What we're going to do now is we're going to add some coding. We're going to get into the other file associated with the web page, and that is the code behind file. Remember that there are, for every web page, there are two files. There is the ASPX file, and in our case, there'll be an ASPXCS, CS standing for C sharp. Were we doing Visual Basic, it would be ASP.VB. All right. Now, the ASPX, think of it as being the user interface, the appearance, the presentation. The ASPXCS file, that's often called the code behind file, is where the behavior goes, where the processing logic goes where we take stuff from that user interface and do stuff with it. All right. Now, we're going to do a bunch of stuff with it, but we're going to start out simple and just do some really, really basic things, and we'll play around with some of these controls, and we'll do uh, any number of things. All right. You don't have to have a separate file for your code behind code, but I would suggest doing that. So I believe the textbook in the first chapter it puts everything all in one file. Don't do that. Just jump ahead and put everything in the code behind file. Keeps everything cleaner. All right. It also allows if two different people are working on um, the application for them to uh, be able to sort of uh, di divide up the work nicely. For example, if I uh, had a graphic designer and a programmer working on a project, which in larger projects is pretty typical. All right? I could teach the graphic designer enough about the ASP.NET controls so that they could bring them on the page and, and style them and do things like that. All right? But then I could give someone else a task of actually writing the code that actually does its thing with, with those controls. So it's a nice way to divide up the work. It also, by separating like this, um, lends to maintainability. Uh, makes it easier to maintain because the processing code's in one place, the appearance is in another, uh, another place. It's real similar in a way to what we did between CSS and HTML. By separating it out, um, that's a way to increase the, the maintainability. It just makes it very clear of what is where. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to add a button to the screen that will make the calendar visible or invisible. Right, I'll, I'll make a show button and then a hide button, or a hide button and a show button. So we'll look at this calendar. Here it is. What is the ID for the calendar? The ID is calendar one. All right. I could go and change that if I wanted to, but just for simplicity, I'll leave it at that. Now notice one of the properties of this calendar control. One of the properties is visible, all right? which means that initially, when this page loads for the first time, that visibility property is set to visible, which means we can see the calendar. All right? Now, that's one way that we can set the properties of this is by, in design mode, we can go into the properties and we can manipulate them, we can set them however we want to. And that will give us the values for when the page first loads. However, a lot of times we want to manipulate that programmatically. Now, if we don't want it always to be visible or always invisible, we want when the user clicks a button, make it invisible. When the user clicks a different button, 
make it visible and go back and forth. So let's add on a couple of buttons, one that will make the calendar visible and one that will make the calendar invisible. I'm going to go in, I'm going to drag an ASP.NET button over. And I'll drag a second button over. All right. There they are. I will go in, and the text of this button, the text property is button. I'm going to change it to say hide calendar. And the idea of the button is button one. I'm going to change the button to btn hide. All right, this one I'm going to change to btn show. And I'm going to change the text of it to be show calendar. Now, if I go and run this right now, it, doesn't, it isn't going to work, right? Because I have not specified any code um, that says what to do when you press this button, what to do when you press that button, right? I've put everything in the ASPX file that's needed, so the appearance is right, the user interface is right, the presentation is right, but the behavior or the processing of this hasn't been done yet because I haven't added anything to the code behind file. So if I click this, notice it's refreshing the page. But it's not really doing anything. All right. So now we're going to go in and we're going to go and do that. So. Close out of here. All right. Now, I want to write the code for this button. All right. That code is going to live in this code behind file. And right now, all we have is a shell of the c -sharp code behind file. Now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to go to my user interface, and I'm going to double-click on one of the buttons. And when I do that, what I get is I get a new function, a new method, protected, void, btn, hide, underscore, click, and then blah, 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 other stuff. Now, what is this? This is what's called an event. All right? An event is something that, that happens, uh, typically something that the user sort of triggers. All right? Now, What's the typical thing that a user does with a button? Clicks it, right? So therefore, by double-clicking on the button, it takes you to that controls, that component's default event, all right? Now, if we look up here, I'm going to put my cursor in this event, in this, in this method, maybe. I can look and see a list of all the different things and events on the page. All right. But right now, I'm in button hide underscore click event. All right. So this is where we put the code that we want to have execute when the button is clicked. All right. This is where we put the code that we want to execute when the button is clicked. Now notice.